Thursday, April sometime. 28th uh, for you guys. Um, E-learning tomorrow, and Leela, I'll get you in just a second, is going to be the um, outsider's test. I cut it down to 25 questions. And with that one, it is a one-take test, not our normal two-take, since it is going to be the Friday e-learning and you're not going to be here. And you have a 40-minute time limit, because I don't want you spending all day on it. So I figure 40 minutes, one take, 25 questions. As long as you've been reading, you should be fine. What I am aiming for is if you've read and paid attention, it should be like a 15-minute quick test. If you've not been reading but have been paying attention, It'll probably take you a little bit longer and you'll probably get closer to a C. If you've done no reading and have not paid attention to me, uh, you're kind of screwed. That's, that's how life works. Uh, I'm not really sure how to help you out on that one. But we'll talk about all that here in a moment. Leela? Can I sit in the hallway? Um, no. AR? So say you um, listened a little in class huh? and read a little huh? and you watched a movie. What grade do you think I'm about to get for that? C to D, maybe? Uh, the reason I say it is because I've also, if you've not watched the movie, I highly recommend it. The movie's awesome. Uh, but the problem is I've also watched the movie, and a lot of the questions don't necessarily come from that one. Um, Leela, if you want to give your shoe to her, then that is fine. And then as long as you... Just set it under here. There you go. And then put your phone on your desk, and then you can slide back. That's fine. Okay. Um, and so a lot of the questions don't come from movie. Uh, just because I know what was in the movie, so when I write my own quizzes and tests and stuff like that, they don't usually overlap. And my questions kind of require thinking. Jameson? Um, where can you find the movie, like on Netflix, Hulu? That I don't know. Okay. Um, I just told, I hold a kid told me HBO Max, but I don't know if they were just randomly saying that or if they actually knew the answer. I was on Prime. Could be, yeah, I have no idea. Okay. It sounds like a research question for you guys to figure out from there. Well, I mean, after you figure, or you can do it before you want to take the quiz. That's fine for me too. Why is it so big? Because I had a lot of room. I didn't know we were going to be so judgy. Uh, speaking of judgy, let me do a question first. Because I've been asking this to my classes, they sort of directs the conversation we have today. Um, don't answer the way you think I want you to. I actually want your honest answer. Oh, and Emerson, I've not forgotten. See me at the end and we'll hook you up. How many of you guys have finished reading the book? Like, you've gotten all the way to the end. Of the end. Okay. And for my next question, if you haven't, that's fine. How many of you guys are, like, around, have at least gotten to chapter 9, 10-ish? I've gone Okay. How many of you stopped reading when I stopped reading with you back around chapter 3, 4-ish? Okay. It, yeah, I'm not going to lie either. That's fine. Yeah. And I'm not attacking you on it. It just it helps direct my conversation today. Uh, because one class period I had was similar to you guys numbers-wise. And another class period I had, literally I had three kids who had gotten past Chapter 9. And the rest of the class hadn't gotten past Chapter 4. So there's no point in me talking about end of book if no one has any idea who's in it. Those of you who have gotten to at least chapter 9, 10, or have gotten to the end, did you enjoy it? Is it a yeah. book yeah. that you've... Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, for those of you who... One word, that's yeah. more... Shadow Club was so, better. Oh, Shadow Club was not good. Well, what? Welcome to Shadow opinions. It's fine with me. I didn't mind Shadow Club. So, a, a background on my thinking here for a moment. I am aware that... This is the longest you guys have been in school since elementary. That fifth grade was a shortened year. Sixth grade was an off and off shortened year. And so by this point, you have been learning in, in an educational setting longer than since recess and elementary. I understand that a lot of you guys are getting to a mentally burned out point just because of the stamina that is required to go through a whole year of learning and dealing with all this. Completely understand all of that. When I was trying to figure out what to do this second semester and trying to figure out how to arrange things, I thought about putting speeches like here at the end now, because I knew you guys would be getting tired, but at the same time, coming into like after December, end up January, February, where people are all tired and depressed and it's dark out, I thought that might be a better time. So I moved this book towards the end. 
the way I look at it is, if you've not read it, that's fine. I would recommend watching the movie. It's a good story. Uh, and I think it's a story that kids would in enjoy, and I completely understand you being to a point where you don't want to. If you get a chance to this summer, if your parents make you read a book, or next year you get a chance, I recommend reading it, because it's one that I think is worth enjoying, and I enjoy the conversations that go into it. Next week, we're going to start the sequel to it, which is a shorter book. It's also a more adulty book. It deals with more severe topics. Um, it deals a lot more with um, what do you do when your friends start doing drugs or going down a bad path. Do you choose to hang with friends or do you choose to abandon them and go? And so it deals with some pretty big topics, which I like for the end of the year. So teacher-wise, teachers have also gotten worn out this year because we've not had to teach a full year since you guys were in elementary school year. And I think there's a lot of teachers who are getting grumpy at this point for the same reason that you guys are. Um, here's my worry for you. One of many worries. Watching my first period take I learned this past week, I was reminded of a phrase that we get taught to us at our English meetings that is called reading stamina. Do you guys know what reading stamina is? Yeah, yeah. stamina to read. Yeah, and so stamina applies to everything. Like when you have to go out and play sports and be able to read, it's just how long you can do a thing before exhaustion. If you're on the track team and you have to run and you have to run a mile and you've never run a mile before, you get half mile in and you just pass out. That same thing applies to reading. If you're not used to having to read a lot and then suddenly we throw a lot of reading at you, it's not easy. Uh, it's tiring on the eyes, it's tiring on the brain, and it's, it, it's not easy. I watched my first period struggle with reading this week on iLearn because of that reading stamina issue. And it made me worry about whether I did a good job preparing you guys this year reading stamina wise. Selfishly, I enjoy reading to you. Uh, I know you guys enjoy it because you get to be lazy, but I enjoy it for two reasons. One, I really enjoy the sound of my own voice, but two, <laughs> it's the truth, two, I really enjoy watching you guys enjoy a thing. So when I read sections and you guys get worked up and you guys react to a thing, as a teacher, like that's why I do it. So when I make you guys read on your own, I don't get to watch you enjoy a thing. I just have you guys come back and go, that was fun, and then you sit. But when I read it to you, I get to like watch your eyes get excited, and you guys get all yeah, like, oh my god, that guy got stabbed, and you guys get all worked up. Like as a teacher, I enjoy that, but I don't know if that failed you when it came to things like I learn, because I'm assuming I learn was a struggle this week with the reading and stuff. That no, good. I mean, if it wasn't. I worry, my worry was that watching, again, my first period might be a special class, but watching them do it, and like you got to the sections where they're like 18 paragraphs, and I watched my kids go, yay, 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 see, 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 and like they were just like, I can't do it, and so that's where like me reading to you versus having you read on your own gets to be a tough balance at times, and so I tried to find a book that if you had to read it on your own, it's one I thought you would enjoy. Same thing with like the one we're going to get to next week. The sequel to it, it's the, sort of that same idea. If you had to read one, it's got a lot of those things I think will you'll enjoy and will get your attention and stuff like that. All right. Did I talk to you guys last week about, or this week, about iLearn and how iLearn works? Okay. I talked to one of my classes. I didn't remember who it was. All right. So, because I had a kid ask me er, earlier today or yesterday, if we write a bad essay on iLearn, are we going to get held back? And I realized you guys have no idea how iLearn works or how we use iLearn. And I don't think anyone's ever explained it to you. So allow me to take a moment to interrupt the outsiders to do a thing that I would rather you guys know than not know. Here's how iLearn works in two ways as far as the school is concerned. One iLearn lets our school know if we're doing a good job, like nothing about you guys at all. And it's not necessarily about the teachers, it's more just as a school district. And here's the reason. 
When I went to college, way back during dinosaur times, I was like an A-B student in high school, and I went to Indiana University, and on my dorm floor, I met a, a kid down there who was a straight-A student from his high school. And I was, my, my first thought was, oh my God, this kid must be a genius compared to me. He had straight A's at his high school, I was only an A-B student. But over the course of our first semester there, he struggled. And he ended up failing out of college his first year, and I was like, how does that happen if you had straight A's? And talking to him, I found out that he went to this little hillbilly school out in the boondocks of Indiana. And you got an A if you showed up to class and didn't fight with the teacher. That was all it took. Like you didn't have to turn in homework, didn't have to really do quizzes and tests. As long as you didn't fight the teacher, showed up to class, you got an A every day. And so he went to college with straight A's and then got to college and they were like, do this work and he was like I've never had to do work before and it overwhelmed him and it was a friend of mine who then dropped out and had to leave college that is why they started doing iLearn not necessarily for you but because they don't want to have a school system like that that just gives kids grades and then they go on to college and fail so this is a way of holding schools accountable now for that that means little to you because you don't care about teachers and you really don't care about the school and you really don't care about the school district. It's not about you, it's about being a kid. Why would you care? Here's how it impacts you individually. If you fail iLearn, you don't fail seventh grade. Here's a shocker to you. You can't fail seventh grade. We don't hold kids back anymore. It's not a thing that exists. I realized yeah, I realized a lot of kids are scared of a thing that doesn't exist. So if you are unaware, we have not held a kid back in 15 years. That's not true. Yeah, that's so cat. Oh, no. In a moment, yes. Um, it's one of those things. Now, give it. There's a difference. Your parent can hold you back. And that is a thing where if your parent, which happens on occasion, if your parent can fight the school to have you repeat a grade. But school-wise, we do not hold kids back anymore. It's not a thing that we do. We don't do it in seventh grade. We don't do it in eighth grade. Now, given it used to happen, and because it used to happen, the rumors are out there, and kids use it as like a boogeyman to scare each other, but the actual holding of kids back isn't there. But here's what you have to realize. Your iLearn does impact. NWEA and your grades in class do. If you are unaware, we have kids in seventh and eighth grade who have double English and double math. They don't hold kids back anymore. What they do is take away some of your classes and give you double English and double math. Because if you fail iLearn English or fail NWEA English or you fail English class, that tells the school you're struggling in English. So instead of holding you back, eighth grade, they take away art and give you a second English class. Or they take away choir and give you a second math class. And we have kids right now who have that going on. It's not a punishment. It's a way of trying to help those kids out. Because holding a kid back almost never worked. In my years of teaching, I've had three kids that I have taught that were held back from like the Globetrotters or Stars. Because if you're held back, you don't go to the same team again. Like if I fail a kid and you fail my class, you don't get to have me again. Because the thought is, I failed you. Why would you have my class again if I'm a bad teacher? So they give you to a different teacher. And I have taught three different kids, all three boys, that I've taught over the years that failed off of a different team and they held them back. It never made a difference. The reason being is if a kid fails seventh grade, it's not because they don't understand. A kid fails seventh grade because they don't do work. And then making you come back the next year, you fail again because you don't do work. And so it was the same thing. And they realized what we need to do is give you more of what you're missing. And so you have those extra classes. So with that one, and it's not straight off iLearn. If you bombed your iLearn essay, that is not straight to having a second English class. The joy that teachers get to have at the end of the year, we get to have these really fun meetings we go to where I get to look at all of your data and I get to go look at Bobby and go look at Bobby's iLearn score, look at Bobby's NWEA score, look at Bobby's class grade. Does this tell me that Bobby did not learn English this year? 
If Bobby struggled learning English this year, Bobby gets to take a second English class next year. You will have your normal English class, Watson, San Giorgio, or Smith, and then you have a second English class with Mrs. Kakaska or Mr. Henderson or something like that, and you get double English. So that's where it comes into it. But it requires lots of different things to happen, so it's not just a straight up. Now with that, I'm not telling you to just fail seventh grade or fail eighth grade. If you go to eighth grade next year and you don't pass a single class and you get an F in everything, you're still going to high school. I'm telling you now, you won't stay behind. We have kids right now who are failing everything in eighth grade and still go on. Here's where it gets tough. In high school, because my kids have found this out, both my freshman and my junior, when you fail a class in high school, you do take that same class over again. My freshman daughter hates her English teacher and has refused to do work. Regardless of how much I punish my child, she is failing her English class. She is next year as a sophomore, has to take sophomore English and freshman English both. So she loses out one of her fun classes and has to repeat that class over again. If she doesn't, she does not graduate. That's how high school works. They give you the opportunity. And if she fails that English class again, her junior year, she'll take, and you keep, and you'll be a junior, like 18 years old, sitting in a class with 14 year olds because you keep retaking that class over and over again. So that's what we're trying to prepare you for is the fact that when you get to high school, it is a different game. But I didn't want you guys to have a wrong belief and, and be fearing a thing that doesn't exist. If you guys finish the year with Fs and like, I didn't get held back, I beat the system. You didn't. There is no system. That's not how it works. We move you on no matter what. Logan? Okay, so I have a friend who hmm? has um, like three classes with Mrs. Miller, so hmm? is that like double English? No, that's a whole, and so that'll be kids who are in resource, and resource is a whole different thing. Those are kids who have like a learning disability, like ADHD or something like that, and so it's to help them out. Because uh, my my older stepbrother is dyslexic and had like has a read where the letters get mixed up, and so he had a resource class on top of it to help things out, and so it's a whole different thing. That's not like a like a lot of the kids in those resource classes pass I learn and have no like grade issue. Is to help them with a whole different set of just like the kids who have diabetes or a kid who has a wheelchair. It's just with their learning. Anissa. So, like, if you fail, like, English in, like, your freshman year, mm -hmm. and then your junior year, you also fail, like, freshman and junior English, then your sophomore year, will you take three English classes? And what happens, if you start fail, like, if you fail enough of those classes, then, yes, you'll start, they'll start forcing you to either do summer school, or you just end up becoming, like, a fifth year or sixth year senior, where, like, you're 19 and 20 years old and still in school, and eventually some of those kids get frustrated, and that's where you get kids who drop out. Because they're like, I don't, after a while, they're like, I don't want to keep taking freshman English over and over again. And when you hit 16, we can't stop you from dropping out of school. And that's where those kids get frustrated and drop out. And from my end as a teacher, I don't want that because I've had my past students drop out and come back and talk to me. And I have so many high school and college kids who come back after school and come into my room to sit and talk. And I've had my kids who have been dropouts. I've had my kids who are in my advanced classes drop out in high school. Because just because you're advanced does not mean your life is good. And they struggled and they would drop out and they come back. And so a lot of what I do in class is from talking to those kids who dropped out. And I'll ask them, what could I have done to help you stay? And a lot of it was learning discipline or being forced to turn in stuff. And those things where they don't have parents at home who necessarily make that happen, I try to be that parent for them. And so that controls a lot of what I do in class is trying to give those kids stability because I don't want them to have those English classes, multiple ones, and then get overwhelmed and then drop out. But yeah, you absolutely. When there's kids who are juniors who just take three English and three math classes, and that's it because they're like the required classes, and it's a nightmare, and I don't want that for kids I like. Yeah, so. Do you have to go to summer school if you don't pass either? No. Um, the way it works again is, at least to my knowledge, I am not aware. I mean, I don't even think we really offer summer school for the most part my anymore. My brother went to summer school. Is he high school? No, he's an eighth grader. Is he? And so a lot of times, I think they probably this year they're offering it coming up, but a lot of times they'll offer it but not require it. But he went in like fourth grade. 
And that could be elementary school. I don't know as much about how that goes. And so elementary school may be completely different. Plus, if it was years ago, it's changed since then. And within the last five years, the, how they do summer school has changed in our district. Anton? Is, is there any like, benefit to taking summer school even though you like passed all your classes and you have like enough credits? In high school, yes. In junior high, not really. Uh, in high school, both of my kids take it because there's like, if you can take summer PE, yes. Because both of my kids took summer PE because then you don't have to take PE during the school day, which neither one of my kids wanted to do. And you do like six weeks of it in the summer and then you're done. My daughter struggles in math. And so she takes math classes in the summertime because they're smaller classes and she feels like she gets more help. So she takes summer school math because she likes how that class is taught better. But if beyond that, I have some past students who take, even though they're like A students, they'll take summer school to get classes out of the way uh, because they're like some classes they want to be able to take and so they can't get it into their schedule normally, so they'll do it that way. So a lot of times you can take a summer school class that's just one that you want to do and they offer those two. Okay. Did you have a question, Serena? I don't want to ignore you if you had. Okay, from there on to that one. Um, not the conversation I planned to have with you guys today, but I realized from the I learned that there was a chance you guys didn't know that, and I wanted to tell you. Miles. Are we going to talk about outsiders? Getting ready to right now, yeah. So with outsiders, those of you who have done Reedy Bits, towards the end, it's there's not a whole lot confusing that's in there. Definitely sad. Um, my oldest, to tell you, like my oldest daughter, if you need to bring her any, I can sign it for you. My oldest daughter, she bawled during Outsiders, uh, which she has like a heart and emotions and stuff like that. Um, hang on. Just... For me, I don't remember crying during Outsiders. So I remember reading it in junior high. The next book, the sequel, I do remember crying during. For me, it is the first book I remember actually crying while reading, and I'll explain to you when we get to it why. And it's and. Oddly enough, in the sequel, it's not even a death. Like, there is death in it, but the death didn't hit me. There is a decision one of the characters makes that is heartbreaking with the decision that he makes with a friend that you see these things coming and then what happens because of it. I was going through a similar issue with my own friends, and it broke me. And I remember just bawling as I read it. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that coming up. Well, it's called That Was Then, This Is Now. So, with the whole Dally Winston... Got shot by the police. He does get shot by the police. Hang on. He was just the kid, that's what they said. Correct. There we go. Right? It's like you're really there. So, with Dally and the whole police issue and the thing that happens from there... Why does does Dally know the gun's not loaded? No. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Do the police know the gun's not loaded? No. So why does Dally point the gun at the police? Because what does Dally want to have happen? So this was his way of committing suicide. Realize Dally only had one thing he cared about. That one thing being once Johnny's gone, Dally. His life sucks. He doesn't have parents that care about him. He has friends, but his friends are only kind of friends. Johnny was like that little brother that was the only thing that he cared about. And when Johnny dies, Dally has that I no longer want to go on moment. But being the tough greaser, he can't just commit suicide because of a friend. So he wants to die in the coolest way possible. And for a greaser, the coolest way to die is... And so that's why he forces the cops to shoot him. Now, at the same time, he wants his friends to know why he died. That's why he calls his friends to come watch when he called them up. Because when he called them up from the store after he had robbed it, he knew he was going to die. That was his plan. Calling his friends to watch was his way of saying goodbye. Boys aren't real good at emotions. Sometimes they're a bit of a struggle. Dally even tougher with emotions. So he wants to say goodbye to his friends and let them know why he's dying, but words aren't going to work for him. 
So his way of going out there and doing that whole eye contact thing and then turning and pointing the gun, and they're like, what are you? That was his way of saying goodbye to his friends. And at that point, Pony Boy then passes out. And when he, hang on. It's hard, doesn't it? So, Pony Boy, right after Dally gets shot, that's when, yeah, Pony Boy's like, and then passes out. Do you know how much time has taken place in the book from opening chapter to that moment? A week. A year. Yeah. It is exactly seven days. In seven, just so you're aware of what happened to him in seven days. Walking home from a movie, he gets jumped by a bunch of socias who hold a knife to his throat and attempt to kill him. He then gets saved. The next day, he goes out to the movie with his friends and gets flirted with by a whole bunch of really cute cheerleader girls. And then from there, gets walked home, gets almost jumped by the socias again, falls asleep in the park. From there, goes home, gets slapped by his older brother, runs away, goes out to the park, gets attacked by the socias again, gets drowned, passes out, wakes up to see his very first dead body ever, has his best friend admit to murder right there, leaves in the middle of the night on a train, goes out to this church in the middle of nowhere, lives there for five days, living on bologna and cigarettes, from there goes out and goes to Dairy Queen, from Dairy Queen goes back to a burning church, goes into burning church, throws children out of a window of burning church, has burning church collapse on him, has burning church crush his best friend, goes to hospital, from hospital ends up going to Rumble, in Rumble gets into fight, gets kicked in the head, gets a concussion, from there goes to hospital, at hospital, watches his best friend die in front of him, stay cold, and then from there gets picked up by a stranger who takes him home and then has to tell his brother and friends about the fact that his best friend just died. Then goes out to the empty lot to watch his other friend get shot in front of him. This dude's life sucks. That's in seven days. Any one of those would have made your Snapchat story. He had all of that in a single week. His brain literally just shuts down and goes, no. Bink! He's like, Argh. it just falls down and passes out. When he wakes back up, he was in the hospital, and he thinks he has to go to court for the killing. That's not why he goes to court. Do you know why he went to court? Because he has to leave the home. Yeah, because the whole point of him living with his brothers and no parents is if he doesn't get in trouble. Death, death, stabbing, death. And so at some point, they're like, that's bad. So he has to go to court. He thinks he's going to court because he killed Bob. Did Pony Boy kill Bob? No. And that was the argument he has with Randy. Pony Boy is so messed up and so sad that he's trying to find his happy place. His happy place is killing Bob. That's how messed up his life is. He's like, oh, life would be happy if I was a murderer, and then my friend would be alive. And so he tries to imagine a world where Johnny's alive, but Bob is dead, and only two greasers were there, and if Johnny didn't do it, that means he did it. So he convinces himself he killed Bob, which is why I wore the shirt yesterday, because Ponyboy kept saying, I killed Bob, when he was talking to Randy. He's like, no, you didn't. And that scene always kind of made me giggle. And he was like, I killed Bob. And so he didn't kill Bob, and then he goes to the court after that, and they're like, he keeps trying to say, I killed Bob. And they're like, no, no, you didn't kill Bob. How's your brother? And he's like, my brother's great. And then he ends up getting to stay with him. End of the book, that last section, he has to write because he has given up. As you can imagine, much like you guys with school, Pony Boy has given up. And he's like, I am done. And so he's just stopped doing all of his work. And his English teacher's like, hey, I don't want you to fail. To not fail and have to repeat this class like we just talked about, you have to turn in this final essay about something that's important to you. And that's where he ends up writing about something that's important to him. And the very end of this book is him saying, when I walked out of the movie house, I had two things on my mind, Paul Newman and a ride home. Where did we see that before? So what does he write as his essay? This book was his essay, where he wrote about the things important to him, which were his friends. Because for him, friends were super important to him. And so this whole book then becomes this essay that he wrote about the thing that was important to him. This book was written by a 16-year-old, and so her name is Susan Elaine Hinton. She's actually Cherry. She wrote herself into the book, 
And so when you get into the parts of it, so she wrote it because she got into a fight with her English teacher because her English teacher kept giving her books that she thought were crap. And so she refused to read them. And his response was, young lady, if you don't like my books, you should write your own. So she wrote her own and she wrote it about her friends because she had these two groups of friends that kept fighting at school. And she kept trying to tell them, you're going to eventually kill each other. So she wrote a book where one of her friends kills the other friend. And that became this book that goes into it from there. Yeah. No, luckily they did not. So this is one of the things where when she wrote this, because she wrote it, it ended up sort of helping things. Enjoy your weekend. Be good. Good luck on the test.